Thank you also for joining us for today's info session on the Right to Repair Directive proposed by the European Commission. Today will serve as sort of an opportunity for you to learn more about this EU proposal and ask questions directly to Maltese policymakers who are involved in the negotiating process. I must say that it is a rather short proposal, but it is all the same very important and will affect businesses and consumers alike. By way of introduction, I am Gabriel, the Malta Business Bureau's Policy Manager for Sustainability Files. My job here is to follow these developments at the EU level, gather feedback from businesses and represent their interests in Brussels. For those of you who are not aware, the MBB is the EU Business Advisory Organization of the Malta Chamber of Commerce and the Malta Hotels and Restaurants Association. With me today, I have the Malta Chamber Policy Executive on Sustainability, Gabby Greg Larson, who will be delivering the Chamber's perspective on this issue, especially from a sustainability perspective. Uh, we are also joined by officials from the Malta Competition and Consumer Affairs Authority, the MCCAA, uh, Grace Stevala, Director General Office for Consumer Affairs, and Andrea Gendo, Senior Manager, EU and International Affairs. Grace and Andrea will be sharing the Maltese government's perspective on this file and especially the points which are of priority for the MCCAA. Before these interventions, however, I will deliver a sort of short presentation on the overall proposal for us all to familiarize, familiarize ourselves with what the Commission is proposing. Those who have um, questions, and I encourage you to ask questions, um, can either use the chat or use the raise hand feature on Teams, um, and we will then enable your microphone and camera so you can ask the question directly. There will in fact be a dedicated Q&A part at the end of this session. And now, without any further delay, I will just get into my presentation to start off this webinar. I, you should all be seeing my slides. Please someone let me know if, um, if you're not seeing them. But to start off, so the EU proposal for a right to repair directive. This was actually issued some months ago, back in March 2023. And in essence, this proposal aims to strengthen common EU rules on the repair of defective goods, both within and outside the legal guarantee period. And we will see exactly what sort of measures the Commission is proposing in order to achieve both of these um, uh, both of these issues. But if you boil down the measures, the idea here is to essentially encourage repair and even oblige repair in certain cases instead of replacing the defective good, which will ultimately help reduce uh, wasted products and waste more generally. One th two things that I have to point out, um, uh, which are very important, is that first of all, the proposal only deals with the after sales period, so it does not actually go into uh, details concerning the product design itself and making the product more repairable um, uh, through its design, because that is actually governed by other legislation which already exist or which are coming out at the EU level. Uh, a second and major important point is that it deals only with consumer products. So we're talking about products bought by consumers, so it's a purely B2C relationship, so to speak. Um, and it does not delve into products bought for commercial um, uh, uses by other companies. So at all, I wanted to include this slide um, to sort of get a bearing on what is considered a repairer for the purposes of this proposal. It is rather a straightforward definition, I think, but it's also a good to include. So essentially, it is an actual or legal person who provides a repair service, and this can either be the producer or the seller of that good. But the Commission also clarifies that the repairer can also be an independent repair service provider, so they are not actually linked to the producer of that good or, or they're not actually selling that good. Um, so it's quite a comprehensive understanding of the term repairer, which captures, you know, um, practically anyone who is conducting repairs uh, for, commercial, um, for commercial purposes. 
Now, the first major point which the proposal introduces is the so-called European Repair Information Form. This is a, a new development. Um, here, repairers will be obliged to provide such a form to customers upon the customer request. And what this, inform what this form will include is, first of all, basic information such as the identity of the repairer and their contact details. But more importantly, the form will include information such as uh, the duration of the repair, the type of repair being proposed, the price range, or if the price range cannot be provided right away, how the price will be calculated, and other conditions tied to the repair process. Importantly here, the conditions cannot be changed for a 30-day period. So what this means is that um, the repair service provider can with, decide to withdraw the form, so they do not proceed with the repair contract with the consumer, but they cannot change the conditions being proposed within those 30 days. So it's either you proceed with the conditions stated on the form or you withdraw completely. Um, also, consumers may be asked by the repairer to cover the cost of um, compiling the information in this form. Perhaps there were some labor costs or other costs involved in collecting this information. However, um, where costs are involved, the repairer needs to inform the consumers about these costs before the form is actually provided uh, to improve transparency. Now, uh, this is a, also another important new addition. Um, the proposal by the Commission is introducing a new concept concerning the obligation to repair. And this concerns um, for the de defects uh, which emerge outside the legal guarantee period. So um, uh, producers under this proposal would be obliged to repair certain types of products. Um, here we're seeing a list, so you have aspects such as household washing machines, household dishwashers, refrigerators, displays, etc, etc. So what this means actually is that if a consumer goes to a producer outside the legal guarantee period and requests that their product um, be repaired, the producer cannot refuse. Obviously, it can, the repair can come for free or at a cost, and that is up to the producer and the consumer to uh, agree upon. But um, the point is that the producer cannot just refuse outright to repair these specific types of products. Now, these products are chosen actually because in separate EU legislation, there are requirements regarding the repairability about uh, the repairability of these products. So legislation already exists governing how repairable these products need to be. And that is why they are actually included in this uh, first list, which the Commission is proposing. This does not mean that the list is exhaustive. It can actually, um, uh, if the proposal is adopted and this actually becomes law, the list can eventually grow as new repairability requirements are extended to other products. Um, uh, I said that the, that the producer cannot actually refuse to repair these defective products. However, they can actually they can actually refuse where repair is technically impossible. So let's say there's a scenario where um, uh, the, the defect in the good is um, is quite severe and it is technically unfeasible to actually repair that product. So there the obligation to repair does not does not stand. Uh, there is also the possibility for producers to subcontract their repair services and also importantly for those products which are produced outside of the EU, um, the obligations to repair will fall on the EU representative, the importer or the distributor, which who are bringing the product onto the EU market. Um, complementing all this, producers will also, also be expected to provide certain level of information and access to parts and tools uh, to independent repair service providers so that consumers can also decide to go to independent repair shops rather than the producer to fulfill this repair obligation. And finally also, um, the proposal is foreseeing the setting up of at least one online platform in each member state to serve as a sort of matchmaking platform where 
um, repair service providers can register their profiles and the services that they offer. And then the consumers can actually look them up, compare the services and uh, try to find someone, a repairer who fits the bill for their particular job. Finally, um, this is quite a short amendment uh, within the proposal, but it's, it is also um, extremely important. The proposal is also um, uh, suggesting an amendment to a separate law called the Sales of Goods Directive, which um, uh, governs partly the, the legal guarantee period. So currently, as we stand, when the, a defect in a product emerges, um, within the legal guarantee period, under the Sales of Goods Directive, consumers can go to the seller and request a repair or a replacement. Now, with this amendment, producers will be obliged to repair that product when replacement is either equal or more expensive than repair. So the only scenario where a producer can actually be allowed to replace that defective product within the legal guarantee period is when replacement is cheaper than repairing it. Um, so in essence, um, here we're seeing a situation where the repair versus replacement decision is being taken out slightly out of the hands of the seller and of the uh, consumer, and it will be based on this uh, cost analysis between repair and replacement costs. That is, in essence, the proposal. It, obviously, as I said, this is quite short, but it does have, I think, wide reaching implications uh, for consumer consumer law and uh, consumer relations. Uh, these are my contact details. So if after the webinar you'd like to contact us or contact me specifically about this proposal or any other EU related matter, please feel free. Um, as I mentioned, there is a dedicated um, there is a dedicated Q&A session at the end of this session, which I will be happy to answer questions. But now we can move on to the intervention by the Motor Chamber Pol Policy Executive Gabby Greg Larson, who will be delivering her perspective on what we have just uh, discussed. Gabby, in your good hands. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, as Gabriel mentioned, um, I'm representing the Malta Chamber of Commerce, Enterprise and Industry. Um, and for those of you who are not members, um, I just wanted to give you a brief overview of how the Chamber operates, um, how it ties in with sustainability and a bit of an overview of um, the reasons why these sorts of proposals are being made. So uh, we are the independent voice of the private sector in Malta um, and our principal mission is to actively represent companies from all sectors of the economy, <clears throat> um, ensuring that entrepreneurs can enjoy the best competitive environment and conditions to conduct business in. So we represent the manufacturing companies, importers and distributors, and also service providers, as well as a number of business sections under each sector. For example, in manufacturing, you have furniture and, um, and a number of others, of course. And then in importers and distributors, you have, for example, pharmaceuticals and so on. Then horizontally across our economic groups and business sections, we have committees which are thematic and which apply to all of them together. So, for example, digitalization, economic growth and resilience, human capital. And one of these is, of course, sustainability. Um, and as thematic committees go, um, sustainability is actually the only one which has a dedicated policy person, which is me. <laughs> Um, uh, so out of these sustainability topics, I work on, for example, energy and water, the circular economy and waste management, sustainability, uh, sorry, sustainable mobility and logistics and on ESG related matters, um, uh, generally related to the environmental aspect. Um, uh, as a chamber, we recognize and believe in the importance of sustainability as the foundation on which Malta's future needs to rest. 
So our policy recommendations aim to achieve this transition both as a country, as businesses and as individuals. In fact, in the recent budget, I think close to 100 of our 250 proposals were in some way related to sustainability. Um, uh, these activities, of course, tie in with the with the global context of the climate and ecological crisis that we're currently facing, and specifically in the European Green Deal, which in simple terms um, aims to make Europe an example of taking care of our planet by transforming it into the world's first climate neutral continent by 2050. But um, the Green Deal goes beyond just climate change. Um, it's also very focused on emphasizing a just and inclusive transition. And very importantly, it delves deep into our production and consumption patterns, especially waste of invaluable resources and the creation of a circular economy. So the circular economy is, as Gabriel also mentioned, it aims to minimize waste, of course, and make the most out of resources and, and recycling and reusing materials. This is in stark contrast with the traditional linear economy, which we've all become accustomed to, where we take, make and dispose of, of things. And so the Circular Economy Action Plan is a key component of the EU sustainability strategy because it helps both um, it helps to reduce the environmental impact of economic activities and supports also the transition towards a, a low carbon economy and a resource efficient economy. Um, what's important to note as well is that customers around um, Europe, their expectations and attitudes are changing. And for a large part of people in the EU, environmental protection is something that actually is important to them personally. And the vast majority feel that the most effective way is actually to be able to change the way they consume, trade and produce um, things. So, as Gabriel mentioned, there are a number of legislative proposals which deal with the whole life cycle of the product. So, starting from the inception, withdrawal of resources, how they're produced and so on. This particular proposal or the right to repair is, deals with the use phase of the product. Um, uh, and ultimately this will in the end um, be saving not only in GHG emissions from production processes that don't need to happen and from resources that don't need to be extracted but also is a financial opportunity for both consumers and for the businesses themselves. Um, discarded products are often very viable goods um, that can be repaired but are actually thrown away. I think we've all been faced with a situation where we've got a, a faulty product in our hands and we're not actually sure what to do with it. And we're wondering if it's worth the time and money to try and find a way of repairing it. Many a times we will choose to replace it. And basically this is what we're trying to move away from. Needless to say, it's going to come with its own challenges, um, but I'm a firm believer in finding opportunities in everything. So some of the challenges that we might find as a country are the technical resources from repairers. Um, this is something that we need to prepare for, of course. Um, but opportunities exist also for, for companies to um, educate their consumers, for example, in how to maintain their products in the proper way in order to reduce the need for them to be repaired in the first place. Um, and also for technicians or people with technical interest to find employment opportunities as well. So um, it's a journey which is, is on its way. And um, now I'm going to pass over to MCCA. So, so that they can give you more of the, I believe, the technical details on, on how things are going to be working. Um, if you have any questions, sustainability um, wise, you're very welcome to contact me. I can um, provide you with my email address in case you need, because I'm also in a position through our membership in E and to give high level sustainability advisory services to help you on the initial stages, should you wish to transition your business practices more in that direction. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gabby, for sort of giving us the whole perspective around why uh, this proposal is being uh, put forward and why we're discussing it here today. I think you made very, some very good points. Um, and yes, I encourage anyone obviously to um, get in touch with Gabby 
if we have any questions relating to her work area. Maybe Gab, you can leave your email address in the chat. I, everyone should be able to, uh, to to see it. Now I can leave the floor to um, Grace and Andrea from the MCCAA for their intervention. Um, thank you. Gabriel, thank you, Gabby, and good morning to everyone who's joined uh, this webinar. So um, I'll just head straight to the point. So as Gabriel said earlier, um, the principle that this proposal pursues mainly, uh, I think we can all find them as agreeable objectives. Um, we all want to, well, seek to shift away from the linear economy that Gabby has referred to, and I think we can all agree that preparing more products eventually will result in achieving a better, more circular economy, which is what we're all after. Um, the proposal is agreeable in that sense, as in principle, we find it to be something that should be supported. Uh, the Office for Consumer Affairs within the Board of Competition Consumer Affairs Authority is following this proposal as and with what David has explained earlier, uh, proposal mainly deals with business to consumers so B2C interactions, and hence our role as the consumer health service to protect and uphold consumer rights and consumer protection. And um, we're going to take some time now to go through, basically, we're going to go through uh, a number of articles which we have prioritized uh, from the proposal. Some of them you will note. Uh, David has already mentioned and highlighted. Um, of course, from our end, these were particularly important and of particular priority because they are of additional sensitivity and importance in terms of consumer rights. We understand, though, that there needs to be uh, a balance between both consumer protection and consumer rights, as well as uh, the interests of industry. A balance needs to be achieved, and we're conscious of that and we acknowledge it. Which is why we're here to also listen to your concerns eventually uh, later on during the webinar. Um, I'll leave the floor to Grace, but before I'll just make a little disclaimer um, the proposal is still being discussed, and therefore everything we say today is still subject to change. Um, what that one of 26 other voices. Um, so how we put forward our, our position and our preferences, the whole stuff is uh, taken up. Thank you very much and good morning to everyone and thanks for the invite. Um, as Andrea said, we're going through um, mainly four articles that are of main interest for both us and those of the industry. Um, uh, as Adrian mentioned um, in the presentation, there is a, an article um, relevant um, with regard to the European Repair Information Forum. And it is pertinent to point out um, that the obligation to provide this form rests unconditionally on the economic operators that form within the scope of Article 5. That means the obligation to repair, um, which, which is linked to Annex 2, um, uh, where there is this the products um, that fall, and um, where there is the obligation to repair. Um, uh, any other repairers, however, can use this form on a voluntary basis. So it is conditional on the one on the economic operators um, who sell products or manufacture products that are listed in the end. However, other repairers can use um, this form. Um, it is worth noting um, that when a repairer provides the information required in this form, um, he, will, he or she will also be fulfilling the requirements under the Consumer Rights Directive. I am sure many of you are aware that the Consumer Rights Directive obliges um, uh, from, um, producers and uh, sellers to provide free contractual information on the product or service they are going to offer to the consumer, um, including um, the name and address and uh, information on the product. And this form is complementary to that information. So when a repairer uses this form, we will be fulfilling also the obligations under the consumer rights directive. Um, uh, from our point of view, whilst we do not wish to see an over the application of work also on the um, um, industry, 
Um, we consider it necessary that this information is truly given to the consumer when asking for delivery the service. Therefore, the complementary approach that is within this proposal um, is considered as functional and appropriate from our end. Um, I will now move on on the obligation to repair, referring to Article 5. And we know that the MVP had for some concerns in this regard um, uh, in relation to the obligation to supply independent repairers with access to spare parts and information to perform repairs, um, uh, which is applied across the board. However, it should be noted that this obligation is limited to the products listed in Annex 2. Um, moreover, regarding concerns pertaining to independent repairers, providing the first service for certain categories of goods from a safety and quality perspective, it is understood that the legislation within Annex 2, um, there already um, exist specific requirements to demonstrate the professional repairers' technical competence and expertise. So um, uh, this concern uh, maybe is already in place within the respective directives or regulations under the annex. Um, we would also like to mention the um, online platform, Article 7, um, the online platform for repair and goods subject to repair management. Um, at this point, at this stage, the proposal and uh, obli and obliges the member states to ensure that an online platform exists. However, during the discussions all together with other member states, um, uh, what it's more, um, uh, what the commission to be more, you know, to, be, to create this online platform to upkeep, upkeep and maintain this platform. Um, uh, from a customer perspective. And it would be ideal to have a healthy take up once we have this online platform in place. At this point, it is um, it is on a voluntary basis at this point of the discussions. However, um, can we can get a uh, good take up even from the relevant local operators and um, uh, will be beneficial from uh, our perspective, both for consumers and also for the um, uh, economic operators operating the service because it will facilitate um, uh, um, the way for from the consumers and in order to can go on this online platform and find the repairer um, uh, closest, closest to you exactly. And, um, uh, and also it will also be a window to promote the repairers of any service. Moving on to Article 12, that refers to the amendments to the sale of goods directive, specifically on Article 13. Article 13 of the Sale of Goods Directive refers to the remedies um, available to the consumers when there is a lack of conformity of the goods purchased um, within the two year legal guarantee. What we call the two year legal guarantee. The remedies at this point are repair or replacement. The consumer chooses whether it's repair or replacement. Obviously, there, is a, there are a number of conditions, but I will not go into this. There is also price reduction and then. Um, and termination of the contract will um, be available remedies um, do not uh, settle the problem. Um, uh, although we tend to agree with the principle um, underlying this proposal and this provision, it seeks to encourage and promote repair instead of the aut automatic replacement of products. Um, uh, from a consumer perspective, we want to ensure that the current um, uh, the remedies available to the consumer are not diminished because at this point the consumer can choose between repair or replacement. However, as the proposal is um, uh, indicating, the, and as also was mentioned by the year beforehand, um, repair will be the first option if the replacement is of the same cost or a higher cost. So, in the end, there is no choice but to go for repair. Um, um, so we want to ensure from our end that consumer rights, as they are at this at this point, are not diminished. We also acknowledge um, uh, that there are reservations, um, uh, reservation points on this on this point from the industry and the business consumer uh, community, 
such as questions regarding the assessment on the cost of the of repair versus the replacement. And uh, we are open to hear your remarks in, uh, on this too. We have also identified a number of challenges on the effectiveness of this provision, um, which include the difference of costs related to repair across member states and the limited availability of spare parts, waiting time, um, waiting for your product to be repaired, all of which are thousand in two logistic expenses, such as, for example, shipping. Um, we do acknowledge that these conditions render the compliance with such a provision is particularly challenging for the Maltese operators. However, it should also be appreciated that such challenges are often low with either partially or fully on the consumer, therefore, uh, both economic operators and consumers need to be safeguarded. And that was a brief on our points. We are open to any questions from you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Grace uh, Andrea, uh, for that comprehensive overview of the main articles and provisions which concern the MCAA. Uh, thank you for getting into a more detail than I could in, in, uh, in a short presentation. Of course, um, if anyone has any questions, this now is the time to start putting them um, in the Q&A section or in the chat. I already see some questions coming up and people raising their hands. Um, but even after this session, I encourage people to get in touch with the MCAA um, should they have any uh, other follow up questions um, on this point? I'm going to take, um, I'm going to combine two questions uh, from the chat from Patrick Ajus and Don Hewer, because they touch upon quite similar things. Obviously, I have to preface this that certain aspects may not be in the competence of the MCCAA or their ministry. So we have to appreciate that, that uh, there are limitations in terms of how to what extent they can answer. But uh, Patrick and Don Hewer are asking in terms of whether there will be whether there could be any incentives to support repair in the sense either on the access to parts and incentivizing the actual um, repair process for consumers, reducing costs, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and also on the repairer side to help grow the competence and the technical uh, facilities to conduct repairs. Um, uh, Grace and Andrea, if you could perhaps touch upon these two questions. Uh, that would be great. Well, in terms of incentives, uh, it's not really the competence of the MCCAA to put in or introduce incentives at a national level in terms of repair. However, um, if eventually there will be, and I presume that there will be the need to educate and increase awareness for consumers in terms of opting for repair rather than replacement. Yes, lots of consumer repairs within the MCCAA will definitely play a role um, in terms of raising that awareness and helping to educate consumers. Um, there will also be a role to play in terms of ensuring that whatever measures are introduced to this effect, um, the MCCAA will continue to carry out its uh, duties as a watchdog to make sure that the implementation of such measures and the take up of such measures does not uh, dilute or water down the rights of consumers and therefore that consumers um, can still benefit from the protection that legal provisions provide them with. In terms of repair centers, we're aware that there are some initiatives at government level um, to introduce this concept and have repair centers open nationally. Um, however, allow me to point out that is not really uh, within our competence or remit, and therefore I would rather either receive questions which can then be directed to the appropriate ministry or entities, or perhaps if colleagues from uh, the Ministry for the Environment are present, maybe they would like to uh, intervene and give that reply. Perfect. Thank you, Andrea. Um, in fact, there's another question which I which I would assume is more suited for the Ministry for the Environment regarding the recover the recovering of reusable parts and whether this is feasible. Um, I, I can answer this very briefly. That in uh, parallel there are negotiations on a proposal called the Eco Design for Sustainable Products, uh, which will introduce um, so-called uh, Eco Design requirements. Some of which could be 
repair, repairability, recyclability, recovery, et cetera, et cetera. So this is something which is being negotiated in parallel for specific product groups, not, not strictly under this, this proposal. Now, um, I'm seeing uh, some people with their raised hands. I'm going to um, uh, run the mic microphone and camera access uh, in order that they raise their hands. So first, Sean Kutayar. Uh, Sean, Hi. you should be. Yep. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Yes, yes, Sean. Hi, I just had a question regarding the obligation to repair. You said that in relation to EU products, it's the producer who will be responsible for repairs, while in the case of non EU products, it would be, for example, uh, I believe you said the representatives, importers, or distributors. How how would this actually work? Essentially, and more the most EU products obviously are imported, so we don't have direct access to produce most producers. And in relation to non-EU products, I mean we have many clients who are importers of products who, I mean, they they, they would be suppliers towards sellers and. They might not have the technical capabilities to carry out such repairs. What? How? How would this apply in such instances? Maybe our colleagues at the MCA would like to take this um, question. So, in terms of who will be taking up the responsibility to ensure that repair will take place, this is a question which we indeed have raised at EU level during negotiations. Um, the text should be introducing distinctions between the different operators along the supply chain and will therefore be introducing a distinction between manufacturers, um, importers, distributors and sellers. We would like to see the main responsibility for repair being placed on who is in fact manufacturing the product or in terms of importers therefore who introduces said products within the EU single market at first instance. So not importers if understood in the traditional sense. Um, if you bring, I'll give a practical example, if you're a distributor that brings products into the country, therefore into Malta from another EU country, legally speaking, in terms of this proposal, you would not be considered an importer, but a distributor. An importer is always someone who brings in products from outside of the EU into the EU single market. We want to see that reflected into the proposal. As I said before, the proposal is still developing, therefore we need to see whether this will eventually be introduced. We understand that this is an interest that most member states will want to see reflected in the text. As to who will take up that responsibility, um, again, it's yet to be seen. Um, if I understood Sean's question entirely, because at some point the sound was cutting off, um, if in Moata, for instance, the only operator you would have is a distributor, and therefore someone who procured the product from the EU into the country, then our expectation is that the fulfillment of the obligation to repair would need to be carried out by the distributor or the manufacturer who placed the product on the market, and therefore that would have to be taken care of um, through an interaction between the final seller and the manufacturer from whom the product was procured. That is the expectation. I don't know if that answers your question, uh, Sean. Uh, oh, okay. Um, I think from what I understood, so basically, for example, if we have clients who import products from, let's say, China, that they produce from electrical lights, obviously access to the Chinese producers will be difficult, and our importer is essentially a distributor. If essentially, he just buys the product, puts it on the market, sells it to the way this law is currently written. It is the distributor who will be responsible towards the consumer, but this AS has to be developed. That's all for now. All right. Yeah. Thank you very much. With, with the addition of one point, though, which I, uh, my mistake, I left out, one of the uh, operators which the proposal should be introducing is also the authorized representative. Therefore, for any operator outside of the EU to place its product within the EU market, Unless there is an importer established within the EU that brings that product, that operator from outside of the EU needs to have an authorized representative within the EU. That is for legal traceability and accountability. So there's going to be a, a set 
a set focal point in Europe, basically. There is a push for that, yes, for all manufacturing right. states outside the EU to have an authorized representative within the EU. Granted, if you are an operator based in the EU and you import products from outside the EU single market, then that manufacturer does not need to have an authorized representative because for the purposes of the legislation, you are placing the product on the EU single market. Therefore, the responsibility rests with you as the importer in that case. OK, thank you. Thank you very much, Sean, for your question and thank you, Andrea, for the clarifications. Um, now I can move on to another question by Mary Gertie. I'm going to give you mic and camera access. Um, Mary, can you hear us? Yes, yes, I can hear you now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I have a couple of questions. Um, uh, some uh, some um, producers or let's say some, some retailers offer only a one year guarantee. Is that legal or not? Uh, that's one question. After there is a repair, I have asked sometimes, is there a guarantee after I repair? Because many a time, for example, you um, spend a lot of money if the guarantee is if the guarantee is passed, so you have to pay. And uh, they tell you no, even if, for example, they give you an example of an, an air conditioning unit, the unit costs 650 or 700, you pay 350 or 400 euro to repair, and uh, when you ask for a guarantee, they tell you no. In fact, this was uh, something that happened to me. After two months, the uh, AC went bust again, and I lost not only the, the AC, but also the money I had spent to repair. So that's, uh, that's another thing. Um, uh, uh, aha, yes, with regards to spare parts, is there a limit one has to wait for parts? Sometimes it takes months to wait for a part because they say we have to wait for the container to come. We bring the parts with the with the uh, container. Uh, is there a limit uh, in the law that one says, for example, that you must provide the parts and repair within a stipulated time? Um, uh, the other question is, Gabby, you are absolutely right. We have to prepare for repairs because as in many other things that are changing, even if we take cars, electric cars, there are no, uh, no repairers. So let's not put the uh, horse before the cart or the cart before the horse, I don't know, but put this, put this uh, in place and then there are still, there's nobody to, to repair the uh, appliances or whatever. And uh, another question is, how will this impact the recycling targets? How will it impact the recycling targets? I've or I already have difficulty with the packaging waste directive. If, you, if we are going to import an amount and we need to, to, to recycle another amount, which is a percentage. There are the targets, the EU targets. And now we are repairing. Those are not being thrown away out of the system because they are still being used. How will this impact the recycling targets? I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary, for those for those very valid questions. Uh, but I imagine this is another, this is another set of questions for uh, the MCCAA, uh, Mandrea Grace. I, I took note of the questions. Maybe you, we can walk through them uh, one by one, perhaps starting with the legal guarantee being just one year, whether this is legal or not. Well, the legal guarantee, you know, it's not of one year, it's of two years. Yes. We can go. Yes. Um, I don't know, there's someone else speaking. Um, yes, yes. Okay. Um, so the legal guarantee is of two years. If there is the need to repair the product within these two years, the period of the two-year legal guarantee is that time taken to repair is suspended. So, for example, the, the guarantee is set of two years, and it takes the um, seller or whoever um, two weeks to repair the product. So it's extended two years to two weeks as um, uh, the legal guarantee on the product. Um, uh, I think that um, uh, addresses the first question. Yes, yes, you, you hit the first two parts about the legal guarantee and the guarantee after the repair. Um, 
the third question is whether there is a limit to wait for spare parts. Um, was many, many questions sort of situations where parts take a very long time to, to arrive. Under consumer legislation, there is no specific time and, uh, and which regard to the availability of spare parts. But there is this the reasonable time um, uh, that should be, that where the spare parts should be provided. But we know that there are certain instances, yes, where, where spare parts are not even available. And that would cause a big um, uh, yeah, problem on the consumer. And the last two questions, um, again, I'm not sure whether these are within the competence of the MCCAA, but how we can prepare to have more repairs and increase technical capacity, and how will this proposal affect recycling targets? Um, I think those questions need to be referred to another ministry or another entity uh, that not recycling targets are definitely not within so thank you very much, Mary, and thank you, Andre and Grace, for for your replies. Um, now I can move on to the last question by uh, Marcel Mifsud. Um, uh, thank you, Marcel, for your patience. You should have come around microphone access. Good morning, everyone. <coughs> Um, Amon, thank you very much for this interesting um, uh, inform uh, informative meeting. Um, I have a couple of questions. Number one, um, this right to repair is limited to the list of items you exhibited earlier in your presentation. Would you like to, would you like to state, state all your questions? Okay, that's, that's the, the, one. the second one is, um, the, um, what is the limit or is there a time limit on the right to repair? That means, is this an open-ended um, right to repair? I mean, can I go back to a manufacturer, a distributor or an importer 15 years after I acquire the product demanding a repair? The third, the third question I have, which is more related to the MCCAA, is basically, um, while I fully understand that this right to repair is in respect to a relationship where, where, which is B to C, that means business to consumer, um, my question is, what is the relationship of an, an, an economic operator when dealing with government entities? Are the government entities deemed to be consumer or business to business? Those are the questions I have. Thank you very Thank much, you very much. Marcel. Um, with, with regards to the first two um, uh, questions, perhaps I can pass a comment and then leave the floor also to the MCCA. I think um, in terms of the products which fall in scope, it depends on the type, on the specific article you are um, referring to. So if you're talking about, for example, the obligation to repair, then it's limited to that specific list of products, uh, which is subject to change as new rules come into play. But if you're talking about the amendment of the sales of goods, which affects the legal guarantee period and that repair versus replacement analysis, then I believe that is wider um, than that list. But perhaps um, our colleagues at the MCA can comment. On the time limit on the repair, I believe that the specific legislation linked to that list of products um, specify how long uh, that repair obligation has to has to be in place. It's, it's usually between five to ten years, I believe. But I'll I'll leave the floor to Andrea and Grace to comment further. Thank you. Um, yes, simply I said um, uh, the time period is um, uh, indicated within the different. Um, uh, legislation, for example, for household washing machines, there are three years. These are within the legislation. We also need to go into the um, regulations in the others. There is indicated years um, to be to be applied. For dishwashers, for example, seven years, and we, we can check um, within those within those legislative ends. Now, as to your question, whether um, as to the B to C relationship and uh, consumer is defined um, uh, as in as in the uh, sale of goods directive 
basically it's when you buy a product for your personal use, but we want you to um, bring it out to you and consumer needs and natural person in relation to contracts covered by the directive of sale of goods and who is acting for purposes which are outside that person's trade, business, craft or profession. So basically, um, when you buy it for your personal use and not for a business or anything else. I hope I answered your question. Yes, you have, but I, I mean, let me just give you maybe something a bit more specific. So basically, we, su we supply, for example, to the Ministry of Health medical devices, which eventually might become, might fall under also the scope of a right to repair. I don't, for, for sure, not for now, but maybe in the future, because the list is open. My, my, my question to you is the following, as a distributor supplying the Ministry of Health with medical devices that might fall under this legislation in the future, would the Ministry of Health be deemed to be a consumer or a business? No, oh. it would be considered as a business. Consumer is, as I explained before, when it is for personal use. If okay. someone has complaints, um, should I consider business complaints? For example, I'm going to give a simple example. Uh, trade their bicycle business. And it is for um, uh, If it is being used for this, cannot address that complaint because it is not being used for its personal use. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marcel, for those set of questions. Thank you to the MCCA for your replies. Um, uh, I think that is that was the last question that we had for today. So we're going to wrap up our um, uh, info webinar here. As I said, it is a rather short proposal, but as you can see, it uh, raised quite a lot of questions and discussions uh, since this ha has quite a far reaching uh, reach. It affects us every day in our in our regular lives, not just not just at work. I encourage anyone to, who has any further questions on this file or any other aspects relating to EU affairs or perhaps consumer law to get in touch with MBB, the Motor Chamber and the MCCA, and we will be happy to support you or, or at least direct you towards the appropriate contact to help uh, sort out your query. Um, I'd also like to thank um, Gabby, uh, Grace and Andrea for finding the time to join us for, for today's session. Uh, this is also this is always um, very helpful for us to have to meet businesses and members directly and get feedback from the the horse's mouth, so to speak. Um, and we encourage you to keep an eye out for further events in the coming weeks and months uh, to have further opportunities to get to raise your voice and uh, and get feedback. So thank you, and I wish you all a good rest of your day. <laughs>